Okay, um, welcome. Welcome everybody to this uh, very special afternoon and this special symposium about dispersing the clouds around uh, climate change, uh, which is centered around uh, the award ceremony of the uh, Buys Medal 2023. Um, great to see you all here and um, that you have come here all uh, today. My name is Pierre, Pierre Sibesma. I work at TU Delft and at the KNMI, and it's, uh, 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 I work on the very theme of today, clouds and climate, and I will have the humble task to, uh, to be the moderator of this, uh, of this afternoon. Um, and now for the official welcome, I would like to introduce to you um, Marilene Dochterom, Professor Dr. Marilene Dochterom, President of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts, uh, and uh, Professor Dr. Martin van Aalst, uh, General Director of the uh, Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute, the KNMI. And um, for the welcome, I would first like to ask uh, Marilene uh, Dr. to open the, the meeting. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Dr. Pierre Siebesma, right? <laughs> yeah, we were in the same office 30 something years ago for a while. So yeah, I could say welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Pierre. <laughs> Anyway, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, the KNAW, and of course, a special welcome today to our laureate, Professor Dr. Sandrine Boni, and also her daughter, uh, her daughter, her son, uh, I should say, Marius, Lena, thank you also for being here. Uh, I, I understand you have an interest in clouds yourself, but of a slightly different kind, so very nice to see you here. Of course, a warm welcome uh, to the Director General of the KNME, the Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute, Maarten van Aalst, and all of the other KNME, I will keep saying KNME instead of Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute, if that's okay with you, uh, <laughs> colleagues. Also, uh, a warm welcome to the Chair of the Jury, Guido van der Werf, we will hear more from him uh, in a second. And our uh, speaker, Bjorn Stevens from Hamburg, Thank you for being here. And of course, the moderator of today, uh, uh, Pierre Siebesma. So you are visiting us here at the Trippenhaus. So this is the home of our uh, Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences. Our academy hosts members from all uh, different disciplines. So uh, the humanities, uh, behavioral sciences, social sciences, natural sciences, medical sciences. We're all here uh, together uh, in this Trippenhaus and we're also uh, the home to uh, our young academy, very important, and uh, we also have an academy of artists, uh, so that's uh, who we are. Uh, apart from being uh, an academy where lots of uh, symposia like today's uh, take place, we're also giving out prizes, and some are very special like today's, I would say, because the Buys Ballot Medal, which we're going to award uh, today, is the oldest prize of the Academy of Sciences, it was established by the Academy in 1888 uh, as a tribute to the scientific achievements of the, our Academy member uh, at the time, Buys Ballot, who was also the founder and the first director of the KNME. So I think uh, that makes it again uh, very special. And he was, as was normal, I guess, in those days, uh, specialized in many sciences, mineralogy, geology, chemistry, mathematics, and physics. I'm reading it here, and uh, I'm, uh, I did not check it. But of course, we know him um, uh, because of his many applications in the field of meteorology, and that's the most important uh, for today. Um, besides being a founder and director, first director of the KNME, he was also the founder of the international group that would later become the World Meteorological Organization. I think the importance of international collaboration was already uh, very uh, uh, clear for Baus Balot, but also, I think, for our laureate, a very uh, important uh, drive. Uh, the medal, and that's also special, has been awarded ever since 1893, but only every 10 years. So not every president of the academy gets to award uh, this medal. So it's a special privilege that I get to do that because presidents stay two, three, four years and never 10 years. Um, but in the future, we will actually uh, award it every five years. Last time was uh, about 10 years ago, but this will change uh, in the future. And uh, if you're interested in who the former laureates were, there are quite uh, distinguished laureates and you can find them uh, all on our websites. You will maybe notice then that this year is the first time we awarded to a female scientist. So it's also special 
in that re regard, and I hope this, or expect this to happen more often in the future. So this is the start of a new tradition. Also, as I already said, because we will award it uh, every five years, and then specifically to a scientist who has made an impact in the field of climate change. Um, and uh, this because of the urgency, of course, of uh, this topic. And I believe I will hand over now to the director of the KNME, who will say a few more words about the future. Thanks again for being here and uh, enjoy the afternoon. Thanks, Marlene, and thanks for uh, uh, all of you for joining us here at this very festive occasion. And thank you, Sandrine, for joining us in the Netherlands. Um, it's an honor to, uh, to be able to jointly present you this medal. And it's a special privilege for KNMI to collaborate with KNAW uh, on this medal. Uh, as you noted, uh, Marlene, uh, Bas Palot is my pre-pre-pre-pre-pre-pre-pre-predecessor. I don't know how many pre's I should, uh, I should include there. Uh, and uh, starting a proud tradition um, of science for society, and I think that's something that characterizes lots of work in, in meteorology and climate science nowadays, maybe more than ever before. Um, and it's important we keep telling that story. Um, Sandrine and I were, were discussing already before the event a bit about um, the importance also in an age of actually, again, growing climate skepticism, uh, the importance of going back to the basics once in a while uh, and talking about why we know what we what we know and what we have to act on in a changing climate. And um, it's good to, um, to celebrate that role of basic science in, uh, in awarding you the medal today. And at the same time to celebrate the role of meteorology and climate science in some of the important decisions science society needs to take today with that science. Um, we're having elections in the Netherlands tomorrow. Um, climate hasn't become as big a topic as I had expected it to be. Um, but it's interesting in a way that it, it also hasn't been as divisive a topic as it might have been in the past. Um, so there, there is growing evidence of um, parts of the political spectrum still doubting the climate science that we're celebrating today. But for the most part, we see a growing consensus and it's more a question of how much and how fast. For the Netherlands also how we adapt. Um, and in that sense, it's both understanding what we're doing to the climate system at large at the global scale but also how all the changes that are happening in that system are affecting weather patterns at much smaller scales. And um, in that sense, it's also fitting, I think, that this first time we're awarding this medal, not just to a candidate uh, which deserved it for great work in meteorology, but now also extending it to climate science that we're actually seeing it going to the field of clouds, which, which plays such a crucial role on all of those scales, everything in that, uh, everywhere in that system. So, I think it's, uh, it's really nice to have you as the first laureate with that new shaping of the, um, the, the substance of the metal. And I'm sure there's, there's much more to come because this is a field that will remain important for society, maybe more important than we would have hoped it to be for uh, a while to come, for sure. Uh, and where there's so much exciting science to do as well. And uh, I think that's another thing we should celebrate today here uh, the excitement that we share about, uh, about science and also about telling society about that science. So it's nice to have the celebration here together. Thanks again for Kanaway for the, the great partnership. Um, thank you all for coming. And I look forward to um, the, uh, the different discussions this afternoon, but particularly to your, to your lecture or something. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you both, uh, Marlene and... Uh, Martin, um, then it's now uh, time for um, yeah for the official part and uh, uh, the award ceremony. And I would like to invite to you uh, on stage uh, um, the um, the chair of the jury of uh, the Buys Ballot Medal uh, 2023, Professor uh, Guido van der Werf, uh, to come over and to um, read out uh, Laudatio, please. Thank you, Professor Doctor. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and in particular, of course, Sandrine, um, the renowned Dutch poet Nicolas Bates, he was uh, living at the same time as uh, Christopher Bais Ballot. And Bais Ballot celebrated his 40th uh, anniversary as a professor, and to mark the occasion, uh, Bates wrote an occasional poem titled Onze Grote Meteoroloog. In English, Our Great Meteorologist. It was an ode to which Bates described Bice Ballot's name as extolled and famed, claiming it would be remarked upon wherever the wind blows. 
It was a handsome tribute to a pioneer who put meteorology on the map as a science, and Bicepilot unfortunately died three years later in the year 1890. What would he have thought of present day? Would he have been a leading climate scientist? We will never know, but it seems plausible for someone so inquisitive and passionate about understanding the weather in all its facets and complexities. Fortunately, there are scientists now who are working just as diligently and tenaciously as by blood to unravel the complex phenomena underlying climate change. One of them is at Spotlight today, Sandrine Bonny, um, climate researcher at Sorbonne University Paris and research director at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, pardon my French, Sandrine will shortly be receiving the Bayes Ballot Medal, the 14th scientist to do so since the medal was first awarded in 1893, as we just heard. As chairman of the jury, and on behalf of my fellow jury, jury members, Anne Verhoef and Siebrand Reifhout, I would like to tell you why, of all the excellent nominees, we were unanimous in choosing Sandrine as the winner of the 2023 Bayes Ballot Medal. We assess the nominees in three categories their outstanding international reputation in meteorology, and particularly the field of climate change, their innovative contribution to the advancement of the field, and other factors, such as encouraging young researchers and communicating about the work beyond uh, just their own discipline, but also going to the wider public. And Sandrine Bonny uh, received excellent marks on all these criteria. During her career, Sandrine has addressed one of the key uncertainties of our understanding of climate change, how clouds respond to rising temperatures. This is a huge, crucial research area, given that the interactions and resulting feedbacks between clouds and the wider climate system may dampen or exacerbate climate change. Improved understanding and knowledge in this area will help bring down current uncertainties surrounding the crucial parameter of climate sensitivity. And in particular, Sandrine has developed a new diagnostic method by which she assessed that the main uncertainty in cloud climate feedback was associated with the radiative response of low marine clouds. And by improving the model physics describing these type of clouds, she was able to decrease the uncertainty in these feedbacks with 50%. And she did that by organizing, combining results from field campaigns, process-based cloud resolving, idealized model simulations. And I'm sure we're gonna hear much more about that in the upcoming talks. She used a number of these campaigns and high-resolution model simulation to improve the parameterization and representation of marine low clouds in global climate models. And the main reason for the jury to choose Sandrine Bonny as recipient of the Bayes Ballot Medal is the combination of her diverse qualities. First of all, her groundbreaking fundamental research on a crucial subject, awarded twice with the most prestigious uh, personal grant in the EU. Second, her drive for collaboration with a wide range of scientists. And last but not least, her leadership with regard to setting up crucial field campaigns and co-chairing key panels and working groups, including those of the World Climate Research um, Program and Intergovernmental inter Panel on Climate Change. So Sandrine Bonin has proven to be an extraordinary scientist and possibly the most important meteorological aspect of climate change, namely climate cloud interactions. She's been a key contributor to almost all international bodies that are summarizing progress made on climate change, outlining, also outlining future research areas. And she brings together experimental and modeling research, and also she acts, of course, as a role model for the next generation of female researchers. I'm gonna wrap up. In the jury's view, these combined strengths make Sandrine Bonny a most worthy recipient of the 2023 Bayes Ballot Medal. Sandrine, I'm not a poet like Nicolas Bates, but in receiving the Bayes Ballot Medal, your name will also be extolled and famed and remarked upon, wherever the wind blows, or in your case, perhaps wherever the clouds are blown. Congratulations on this prestigious award. I hope that receiving the Bayes Ballot Medal encourages you to continue pursuing your outstanding pioneer work on the subject of clouds and climate change. I would now like to turn the floor over to Back to Marilyn Dochterom, uh, president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, and Martin van Aalst, director general, and I'm going to make it easy, the KNMI.
Can you hear me? Yes. Well, Mrs. President of the Academy, dear Director General of KNMI, and dear Jury Chair and members of the Bruce Ballot Medal, dear colleagues and friends who are in the room, it's really a great, great honor for me to receive uh, this prestigious Bruce Ballot Medal and for my research on the role of clouds in the climate system. To be honest, I also feel very humble and quite intimidated when I realize that this medal has been given in the past to so many stellar figures of our field. I'm particularly sensitive to the fact, to the decision of the Academy to connect the science of meteorology to the science of climate change, which I think makes a lot of sense and will make even more sense in the future as weather and climate will keep evolving together. I would like to thank the Academy, the jury panel, and the people who had this idea of uh, presenting my name to the, for this great honor. I would also like to extend my thanks to my close <coughs> colleagues, students, and friends, including Bjorn Stevens, who's here, Piercy Besma, <coughs> Kerry Marlon, Jean-Louis Dufresne, with me, and many others around the world, with whom studying the role of clouds in climate has been uh, as exciting as fun over the years. In science, as in music, um, we find ourselves being much more sensitive to some composers or some musicians than to others. And um, I must say that the music that has been developed by the scientists that I just uh, mentioned has been very influential on me. And the music that we have been playing all together um, has been really a great source of joy. It also demonstrated that developing a research primarily driven by curiosity and passion could be a good way also to advance the science, even more so that we do it collectively as a community. It also turned out to be a good way to attract brilliant young scientists to the field and to tackle some of the most pressing questions of our time that include understanding and anticipating the future of our climate. So finally, I'd like to thank my family for their support and encouragement over the years and uh, for convincing me that investing a lot of passion and time in the study of clouds and climate was not incompatible with developing a rich and wonderful family life. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, uh, Sandrine, and congratulations. Uh, of, uh, and uh, um, this is the end of the official part, but by no means the end of this afternoon. Uh, uh, we're going to have a short symposium now on this very theme of uh, clouds and climate. And um, in that respect, I'm very happy uh, to uh, introduce the first uh, speaker of this symposium, which is... Uh, uh, Björn Stevens, uh, Managing uh, Director of the Max Planck Institute uh, in Hamburg, uh, playing an important role in uh, big European programs at the moment, Destination Earth, uh, uh, and also is a big driving force behind global high resolution uh, uh, modeling uh, in Europe and beyond. Uh, and beyond everything, I mean, it has been a very close collaborator on this theme of clouds and climate with uh, with Sandrine. So in that uh, spirit, uh, I think Bjorn, you will give an, a bit of a historic overview about clouds and climate, and especially the role that Sandrine has played in this. So please, uh, Bjorn, the floor is yours. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So oh, this should um, connect here, yeah. <coughs> it's, um, it's really a great pleasure to be here and it's really great, Sandrine, to see you receive this award. I've admired your work and your thoughtfulness for many, many, many years. And um, what better place to be recognized than in the Netherlands? I mean, I, from the very beginning of my career, I've been coming to the Netherlands and having rich interactions with colleagues um, in the Bild. Um, in Utrecht, in Delft, um, here in Amsterdam, 
often on the themes of clouds and climate. Um, I can't think of a community of researchers who have such a, a deep understanding of the role of clouds in the climate system as the Dutch colleagues do. And so it seems like a, a, just a, even a more wonderful um, recognition to have that come from the Dutch Academy of Sciences. So it's, it's really great to try to explain. The other thing is I like telling stories. And it gives me a chance to tell you um, my, it gives me a chance to tell you um, the story of Sandrine Bonny, um, especially because she doesn't like talking very much. So it's really easy to put words in her mouth so I can just kind of rattle on as much as I like. You know, a lot of times people don't really think what a, what is a cloud and what makes one cloud different than another cloud? And I have the feeling that often when people look into the sky, there's some people who look in the sky and they see a cloud and there's other people who don't really see a cloud. Um, so the sensitivity musicians, you can also talk about the sensitivity to the sky. And it's interesting when you look back historically at climate change, how insensitive climate science has been to the importance of clouds. Um, at the very beginning, six years after Boise Balat passed away, as I understand it, this guy came up with this idea that maybe carbonic acid or CO2 could be the driver of glacial cycles. And he put together some ideas and some calculations to estimate um, how important that might be. And so in 1896, and then later, I think in 1902, um, he had a couple fairly remarkable papers where he outlined the modern theory or the modern CO2 theory of climate change. And his work is as remarkable for its insights as it is for its oversights. So when we think about his insights, one was this idea of the, um, the, the, the geometric increase of CO2 um, related to an arithmetic increase in temperature. So doubling of CO2 leaded to additive changes of temperature. So this basic understanding of the radiative physics. Um, the, the quotes here from his paper are, the, the second one, a very important secondary elevation of the effect. You can see this is late 19th century writing. A very important secondary elevation of the effect will be produced in those places that, after, that alter their albedo by the extension or regression of the snow covering. So today we call that the, the surface albedo feedback. As the planet gets warmer, the ice recedes and the planet reflects less light, becomes darker and warms more. He understood that to think about how CO2 influences climate, you had to think about the relative humidity rather than the absolute humidity being constant. And he, um, he also anticipated things like differences in the day and night temperature. So uh, more than 100 years ago, remarkable insights. To calculate this, he had to put together one of the first climatologies of clouds. So he was calculating the radiative balance of the planet. And he said, well, we have to figure out how cloudy it is. But it never once occurred to him that clouds could change. So it's one of the persons who I think you just look to the sky and you take it for granted. So in this wonderful treatise, the, the idea that clouds influence sunlight is there quite plainly. But the idea that somehow that could change never seemed to occur to him at all. In fact, it didn't occur to anyone until about 60 years later there was a, um, a physicist at the Ludwig Maximilians University in um, Munich, a guy named Fritz Müller. And he was doing calculations on this still fairly controversial idea of the, the, the CO2 theory of climate. And the way he was doing the calculations was he would approach it from the energy budget perspective of the surface. And what he noticed in 1963 was that when he included clouds in his model, if he changed the clouds just a little bit, the whole answer changed by an enormous amount. And it's written here. He said, the effect of an increase in CO2 from 300 to 330 ppm can be compensated for, com uh, for completely by a change in the water vapor concentration or a very small change in cloudiness. So he was getting very unstable results by, um, in terms of how we calculated how clouds might matter. 
At that time, he was invited to Princeton University, where he worked with a young man named um, uh, um, Suki, uh, Suki Manabe. He was invited by, by a man named um, Smagorinsky. And working with Suki Manabe, they developed radiative transfer theories. And this paper on the left was the motivation for that paper on the right, the Nobel Prize winning contribution of Manabe, where he sort of resolved the problem that that stumped Muller, because when Muller was doing it, he was calculating how, how the radiative balance changed at the surface. And there you had to account for many more sources of energy. And Manabe had the wonderful insight that if you changed your point of view and you looked instead of at the surface looking up, but you looked at the top of the atmosphere down, it would be much easier to understand how the system responded to an increase of CO2. So in a way, Muller's stumbling over clouds led to a synthesis, Manabe's, in 1967, which laid the foundation of what we considered the settled science, settled science of the effect of CO2 on, on, on climate. But Manabe really didn't solve the cloud problem. He came up with a way to formulate things in a way that made the calculation much more stable. But again, he didn't really consider the idea that clouds could change. It took another 15 years or so um, for this guy to come up with the very first idea that clouds might change. Think about it. Why, why would clouds change, actually? If you, if you think that the relative humidity is constant, and if you think that clouds are just the tail of the relative humidity distribution, then it seems like clouds would change, wouldn't change. Clouds are so varied and diffuse and dispersed, you could also think, well, you know, how could they change? They're just kind of there. Um, Paltridge gave the first really concrete hypothesis of how clouds could change, and just working out the thermodynamic consequences of warming showed that you would expect clouds to have more liquid water in a warmer climate. And this would actually be a cooling effect, something that would lessen the, um, the, the warming effect from increasing CO2. So by the early 1980s, so we're almost 100 years later, it took us until the early 1980s to, to um, appreciate that somehow clouds might play a role in the climate system. At that time, people began putting together climate models of the climate system, um, climate models which included some aspects of the extratropical circulation. So you could resolve or represent extratropical storms. And you would have a global representation of the Earth, which for the time looked quite fascinating. And they began comparing how these models predicted differences in clouds. And this was a startling figure that appeared in Science Magazine in 1989, so nine years after the Paltridge paper. And what it shows is something here called lambda. Um, which, in, as it was formulated here, was the climate sensitivity parameter. So its, it's unit is um, kelvins per watt per square meter. So if you increase the amount of energy into the system by a watt per square meter and you multiply it by lambda, that tells you how much warmer the system is. That's on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, what you have is um, the change in the cloud effect in each one of these calculations. So each one of the black dots is a climate model calculation. And it shows you that differences in the sensitivity parameter, which are about a factor of three, are most, almost entirely explained by differences in how clouds change in the model. So this is a huge, this is a huge <coughs> difference, right? We're, we're talking about a three-fold difference in the sensitivity of the surface temperature or the warming to CO2, depending on what the models did about their clouds. So that's the situation in 1989. I don't know, Sandrine, when you started university, but your first scientific publication was shortly thereafter. So you probably um, were starting your PhD around that time. And clouds were the big puzzle. You know, the models depended a lot on the clouds. And um, there were very, very few ideas how they might change. Um, and it mattered a lot. So this um, carpenter's daughter, um, thought she could actually solve this problem. What a crazy idea. Um, and she wrote her PhD um, on this topic. She was, she was among the first at that time. We were, we were getting satellite observations of clouds, and climate models were beginning to simulate an annual cycle. 
And so she had the idea in her PhD that maybe you could look at how clouds varied across the annual cycle, and you could compare that to observations, and you could get you could make an inference as to whether or not um, some of those models on that scatter plot were more representative than other ones of those models. So it was one of the very, very early attempts, actually one of the first that I know of, which is to, to take the models and ask, um, how can we use observations to help us establish whether the models are behaving realistically or not? And using the natural variability of the system as a, as a clue into how it will behave in the future. Um, she, um, at that time, she also wasn't cooking lots of ideas. She, um, this guy came along in 1997, um, so between 1992 and his brother came along and I guess maybe 1999, and yet another brother in 2003, and she was kind of stashing her ideas away. But after that, in 2005, she, she published this remarkable paper. So she, she, she went to the United States and she had um, uh, a postdoc at MIT where she worked with Gary Emanuel, who she mentioned. She was developing these ideas. She came back to Europe um, and um, um, was working on these further as part of a European consortium. And she, she made this, this really game-changing diagram. It's, it was a very simple diagram. And what it, what it did was it tried to ask how, if you looked at climate models, how would the clouds change as a function of the, um, the direction which the air moved in the model. So this, this, this x-axis here is what we call the large-scale vertical velocity. So if the air is rising as you expect in the deep tropics, or if it's settling as you expect in the subtropics, you would find yourself on either the left or the right of the diagram with the rising air here and the descending air here. And then she took the different climate models that we saw in that previous figure, or ones like those, and she asked if you sorted them um, according to areas where the air was rising or where the air was, was oh, you don't see my pointer here, I'm sorry. Um, if on the left of you if, you, if you sort them by where the air was rising or on the right of the diagram where the air was sinking, um, and then you ask how are the clouds changing, where do you see the biggest difference? And so here, for the very first time, we had this clue people were calling this. I remember I was at UCLA at the time, and the people had said, oh, have you seen this bony gram, the bony gram? Everyone was talking about the bony gram, because it was a diagram which, for the first time, gave some order to this mess of the models, which showed that the red line here, which had models which were very sensitive um, to CO2, distinguished itself from the blue line, where the models were relatively insensitive to CO2, in this region where the number, um, the vertical mo motion field is, is about positive 20, so regions of climatological subsidence. And so what she was showing was that over the bulk of the tropical regions where you have fair weather and gently subsiding air, the way the clouds responded in those regions distinguished models with a high sensitivity from a low sensitivity. So you can see the detective work going on here. We have clouds are important, they make models behave differently, we can try to sort it out. She worked on this quite a bit longer with graduate students, colleagues. I was involved in some of this work and was able to narrow down this, this thinking even more finely by showing here, this is a figure from a paper in 2017 um, uh, that, that, that she led, where she showed that if you, if you look on the far left, you see a diagram which shows a cloud amount with the dark green line showing there's a lot of cloud right at cloud base and then little cloud at, at cloud um, in the middle of the layer and a light green line which shows the clouds more broadly distributed. And then on the right diagram in the green, you see that when you warm that model with lots of clouds at the base, they go away. So there's a big change with warming, and the light green line shows them not going away. And you can do the experiment in another model. So this was one we did in our model, and this was one that they did in the, in the, in the IPS model, IPSL model in her lab. And you see the same effect, that where the clouds, where you have a model where you have lots of clouds at cloud base, um, in a warmer climate, they go away, and this causes the model to have a high sensitivity. And this led to what we call the mixing desiccation hypothesis, which is a sort of counterintuitive idea, but it's on the far right, and it's what the models were doing, is that if you imagine you're in the trades on the beach, you're looking at the clouds, you see puffy cumulus clouds, you see scattered layered clouds, like on the top figure on the right. Air is going through the puffy cumulus cloud, and as, mayor, and, and as you warm the climate, you expect more air to go through that cloud. And counterintuitively, what it does is it brings dry air down from the middle atmosphere 
and it gets rid of the layered clouds at the, at the base of the um, cloud layer. So this is what the mixing desiccation hypothesis says. It's what explains how the models were behaving. And it says that if you could calculate what this mass flux is up through the cloud, and if you could calculate how the clouds change, you might be able to see if the models were doing something physically or not. Um, so now we went from the recognition that clouds explain differences in models. Um, she showed us what part of the meteorological space mattered. And she, with her student, um, Florent Brion at that time, showed us actually very specifically what the models were doing in a way that you could test, that you could actually go into nature and observe. And so she helped design this field campaign called Eureka. And the idea here was to go to an observatory we had set up in Barbados and fly a plane at altitude. Uh, so that's this red circle here. Barbados is about 20 kilometers across. Fly the, the plane at altitude or, uh, in a circle of about 200 kilometers. Launch a bunch of sons around in a circle. Measure how the air is coming into the cylinder or leaving the cylinder. So you can calculate by continuity how much air is going up or down. So you could measure the circulation. And at the same time, fly another plane along this sort of racetrack pattern, back and forth, back and forth, and try to measure the clouds. And so if you did this on one day where you had more air going into the column with more mass flux, did you see more clouds? Or did you see, as the high sensitivity models would suggest, less clouds? So to do this, you needed, on one hand, to measure this large-scale vertical velocity. On the other hand, you needed to measure the clouds. These were two measurements that nobody had ever done before. Up until that time, nobody really had an idea how to measure the large-scale vertical velocity. Um, in an experiment in 2016 and 17, this was joint work with us. We, we worked out this method of, um, of, of, of dropping the sons and seeing if that would work. And it worked beautifully. But we had to develop this entirely new method. And then Sandrine was also passionate about this idea of measuring the clouds by the airplane flying lower down to see how many there were. But think about it. how do you, if you look at the scale of a cloud and a plane flying through them, it's just a almost inconceivable task to how to quantify these clouds. And she said, ah, you know, maybe we could get a radar and we can get a laser and we can point it out the side window and this will work. And I'm like, yeah, 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 how's this going to work? Um, and um, she said, well, you know, we could try it. And so she got some people together and she went to the mountains in France and she got an ultralight and she said, come on, we can put a, a, a LIDAR on that thing and we can shine it out the window and off we go. And that's her there and then off she goes, you know. So this is, this is her uh, approach to science. Um, on one hand, starting from this very big picture, this very important question, narrowing it down, narrowing it down, narrowing it down, and then saying, let's go see if we're right. So um, this, led to this, th this led to these measurements where she showed indeed for the first time that using a LIDAR and using a radar, this is somebody who worked with climate models. She hadn't really worked with screwdrivers at all, but now she's flying around you know, in this plane looking out the, out the, out the side. Um, and you see the scale of the thing, right? So they're there with this little LIDAR. Anyway, this led to this Eureka experiment where we had a big expensive plane and another big expensive plane flying low down. And this shows the plane going um, around one of these 200 kilometer circles. Um, and um, Sandrine's flying in another plane down below, trying with her laser looking 10 kilometers across, looking at how the cloud amount changes. And so you could make two, you see, you, 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 look how complicated that is, these thin pancakes of clouds, these clumps of clouds evolving. I mean, what arrogance to think that you could quantify all that. Um, but, but it was possible. Um, and it led to this remarkable paper um, by a postdoc, and Sandrine's the last <laughs> author, um, uh, working in her lab at the time, Rafaela Fowell. And what it was, each one of those dots is, uh, is, is, is about four hours of these sorts of aircraft measurements going around this 200 kilometer diameter circle three times. Every one of those is probably about 300, 400,000 euros of, 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 of money to make one of those points. And the, the amazing thing, too, is the air bars. You just don't have aircraft measurements of something like clouds or vertical motion with estimates of um, uncertainty, like we're able to be put on that. And the thing that you find, if you remember the story, right, the, the models, if they had a high sensitivity, it means that as you push more mass into the layer, you got less clouds. Here, if you look at the x-axis, it's the mass that's being pushed into the layer. And if you look at the y-axis, it's the amount of clouds. You actually see the opposite. What she showed 
Um, and what Rafaela and, 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 and showed in this paper, I mean, the, the, the group of authors on the paper, was that the, the, the clouds were behaving in a completely different way than we were imagining them in our mind's eye when we put them in the model. And that's because we weren't thinking about how the clouds connected to the motion fields. And if you go through um, Sandrine's work, the, the, the driving element is this idea that clouds are connected to how the air moves. And that doesn't seem like, you know, if we talk about by Balat, um, this, this idea of where the wind blows, it's sort of a fitting thing because you're, you're showing where the wind blows is where the clouds form. And if you don't put those things together, you won't be able to understand the clouds. So that was a major contribution. But at the same time, so she was raising a family. She was, you know, learning how to put um, lasers out of an ultralight and throw things out of a plane to measure cloud amounts and um, looking at climate models. At the same time, she, she, she is an unsung hero of many community activities, and most people don't know a lot of these things. Um, so she's led some of the first community studies quantifying understanding of cloud feedback. So this was, up, um, this was the fourth assessment report of the IPCC. And so she wrote a paper in 2006, which really collected all of the understanding that we had about cloud feedbacks and really made one of the very first definitive assessments of our understanding of the role of clouds um, in, 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 in influencing climate sensitivity. Um, she founded international projects, so European projects, but the Cloud Feedback Intercomparison Study, which brought, to pe brought together people from around the world. That's how we met in 2007 at a meeting you organized in Paris, where it was called CFMIP, the Cloud Feedback Model Intercomparison Project, which she led with a, a, another scholar, Mark Webb, in the UK. Um, she she co-developed the framework, we mentioned this, um, climate sensitivity in the sixth assessment report was reduced, estimates of climate sensitivity were reduced finally by a factor of two. It was huge. We had, we had 40 years of reports where that number didn't budge. How sensitive is the Earth's climate to warming? And, um, and Sandrine um, co-led an activity which reduced that by a factor of two. This is the biggest, I think, breakthrough of the AR6. Um, she led many world climate research programs on coupled climate modeling. CMIP6. Um, she was one of the main architects of. A lot of people cite this paper, Iring et al. Um, Sandrine Boni is one of the authors, but, but I think few people know how many sleepless nights she spent trying to bring the community together to come up with a good experimental plan. And I can't think of anyone who had more of a role in shaping and guiding CMIP6 than um, Sandrine Boni. She co-led this World Climate Research Program on, um, on, uh, on challenge on clouds circulation and climate sensitivity. And as we'll see, she's been a really forceful and eloquent advocate of the role of understanding in climate. This figure is in the run-up to CMIP 6, and there was lots of arguments about how we should put things together. And I think what it shows you is that she's not a painter, but she is a poet. And she's a poet because we spent some days in Bern with a group of us um, thinking of what to do, and we just decided to look at pictures of clouds. And, um, you know, I looked at this picture. There's Barbados again, a huge field of clouds over the tropical ocean. And I look at that picture, and um, I said, that kind of looks like gravel, just a kind of a, you know, a, a smattering of stones on a dark ocean. And Sandrine said, yeah, but if you look a little bit further, you might see flowers. And this encapsulate how clouds change over the tropical ocean and the scale of their motion. And um, Sandrine Boney's eye for understanding um, and sensitivity for understanding how, um, how clouds and circulation are connected together in ways that make all sorts of fascinating riddles for the science. Now, I'm coming a bit to the end, but I want to go back in 2005 um, because in 2005, she, she published several papers. And one of the other papers that she published, I think she was thinking about here. This is, I think that's your brother, Marius. Um, so that's um, Felix, is that right? Yeah, um, who's about one year old. This is 1999. And I guess that's, that's your father, um, Clement. And 
she came back from MIT, was raising her family, and she wasn't only thinking about how circulation affects clouds. Um, in what you would call her Annus Mirabilis, her, her magical year in 2005, she, she published this paper, which I think is one of her best papers, the one on the far right, which few people know. And it really showed how you don't just have to understand circulation to understand clouds, but you really can't understand circulation if you don't understand clouds. So it's not that just the air moving upwards makes the clouds, it's that the clouds make the air moving upwards. So this interplay between clouds and circulation, we're already there full circle in 2005. And this paper is really guiding a tremendous amount of work that's happening today as we build much more sophisticated models and we try to understand what controls very large scale patterns of variability, particularly in the tropics. And these ideas are key guides. Which brings me back to this picture, because in your mind's eye as you look to a cloud, um, Sandrine, in a way, taught us that um, this is not a cloud. <laughs> it's just a picture in our eye. And if you really want to know what clouds are, you have to look past your imagination and into the sky. And sometimes you just have to set out in flight and figure it out for yourself. So it's been really a great 15 years working with you, Sandrine. No one could deserve the medal more. Congratulations. Thank you, Bjorn, for this wonderful historic uh, overview of clouds and climate, and really intriguing to see how Sandrine enters uh, into the story, right? And uh, um, and how she, how that developed our view about uh, clouds and clouds and climate uh, that we're having right now. Uh, <clears throat> but what? Uh, but that's history, and uh, uh, so now it's time for Sandrine uh, to provide us with a view about uh, what's the present. And what's the future? So please, Sandrine, uh, we are all excited to hear about you uh, and about your view on clouds and climate uh, in the present research and in the future. So please. Thank you, Pia. Thank you very much, Bjorn. <laughs> it's always difficult to talk after you, but this time even more than usual. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this morning we had the chance to visit the museum in Harlem and to see this painting from uh, Van Hosdaar, Hos Hosda, right, <laughs> how we say it, and that's absolutely amazing. And one of the reasons why those pictures are so amazing is because clouds really seem to be alive. They seem to be moving, they seem to be growing, they seem to interact with each other, to interact with their environment, for instance, through the shadows. And in atmospheric science, the name that we give to this science, trying to understand the life cycle of clouds and how clouds interact with each other and with their environment, and how that affects the patterns of clouds in the sky, is cloud organization. And what I like to do in this lecture is to tell you how much our understanding of cloud organization has evolved together with our understanding of the coupling between clouds and winds, or clouds and circulation and how that influences today the way we <coughs> study climate and, and climate change. So probably it's, it's probably not completely by chance that a pioneer of meteorology came from the country of windmills. And at a time when French was still the language for scientific communication, this ballot published this paper in the Journal of the French Academy of Science in which he explained that the intensity and the direction of the wind could be understood uh, and, and, and inferred from the measurements of horizontal pressure gradients. And that gave him the idea that if we want to improve weather forecasting, then it would be useful to deploy a network of weather stations in different regions, different countries, and therefore to promote international collaboration. And that's how he founded the International Meteorological Committee. And one of the first achievements of this committee was actually to publish an international cloud atlas. And the reason for that was that clouds obviously were recognized as being a, 
are being chosen of, of weather. And to facilitate the communication among meteorologists from different countries, it was useful to define a standardized or, or, or common language to talk about clouds. And so that's how they, this, this cloud atlas came up. So since the beginning, meteorology has been a, a long story of winds and clouds. But the connection between clouds, weather, and the general circulation of the atmosphere became much more tangible when we started to get uh, satellite observations of the Earth. That's the first mosaic view of the, 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 the Earth from satellite, derived from the Tyros uh, weather satellite in 1965. And as you can see, at first order, clouds are very good traces of the large scale circulation of the atmosphere. And you can see as well that clouds can exhibit many different forms of, of patterns. That's something that we see even better if we look at uh, images from geostationary satellites. That's the first image from a geostationary orbit. And if we look at those pictures, we see that clouds organize or, or display patterns on, a, on many different scales. For instance, on the large scale, you see here this band of cloudiness along the equator. And also at the mesoscale, which is a scale that commonly we define as ranging from a few dozen kilometers to a few hundred kilometers. And those patterns are, are really uh, extremely diverse, often really beautiful. And obviously, the, the high-resolution images raised a lot of interest uh, among meteorologists, including for Edward Lawrence, who said in a lecture on the global circulation of the atmosphere in 1969 that among the many outstanding products of modern technology available to the meteorologists, those high-resolution pictures were obviously very useful, but they were also already challenging their ideas about how the, what organizes the tropical atmosphere. And Ed Lawrence was recognizing as well the very close relationship between water in the atmosphere and the large-scale circulation. Obviously, the water vapor was playing an important role because the condensation of water in the atmosphere was important in the large-scale circulation. But, and he said that the previous generation of meteorologists was talking a lot about highs and lows in the pressure field. But he was hoping that the next generation would be talking more about the dynamics of water systems. And what's funny is that in this lecture, he has a few lines in which uh, he said that, well, when there is condensation of, of water that creates liquid water, and for the moment we just consider the effect of latent heating, but maybe radiatively liquid water does not behave in the same way as water vapor. And it might be interesting to, to study the, the role that it could play. Uh, and maybe it could be more important than just for curiosity. So that was a very prescient uh, remark, I think. And at the same time, um, Another part, another branch of uh, the climate science community or the atmospheric science community was getting uh, increasingly interested in understanding the dynamics of climate and, uh, and climate change. And uh, especially because uh, we had this uh, killing observations showing that CO2 was increasing in the atmosphere continuously. And people started to think about the role of clouds in climate change. And they had recognized that clouds were affecting the, the exchanges of energy between the Earth and space. And therefore, they might uh, play a role in, in controlling the, the surface temperature of the Earth. And already in the 70s and 80s, people recognized that the representation of this effect of clouds on the radiation budget and surface temperature was uh, already a big source of uncertainty in climate models. So that was a good uh, motivation for developing observations of the impact of clouds on the, the Earth's radiation budget. And I had the chance to start my PhD shortly after the, the publication of this paper by Raman Nathan, who was a previous recipient of this medal, by the way. Um, who showed that for the first time that um, on average over the planet, the clouds tend to cool the planet, mostly because of, of the low-level clouds which appear in, in, low, in blue and, and the figure. So at that time, uh, the, the main question was 
whether in a, in a warming climate, this cooling effect of clouds on climate would be enhanced or, or weakened as climate was warming, which in one case would uh, lessen climate change and the other case would amplify global warming. So I started to work on this problem uh, during my PhD and later on. But at the same time, we were recognizing that clouds and cloud relative effects were not only important in modulating the global Earth radiation budget, but they were also uh, constituting a heating source in the atmosphere, and, and they, were, uh, they had this potential to interact with the large-scale circulation of the atmosphere. And that's illustrated by this figure comparing the precipitation predicted by a climate model in which we represent the cloud relative effects or in, in which we have disabled the interaction between clouds and radiation. And as you can see, the distribution of wet and dry areas changes drastically because the, the large scale circulation is much, much weaker in the case when we don't have this interaction between clouds and circulation. So what it tells us is that the interaction between clouds and radiation is also important for the large scale circulation and therefore for the, the distribution of precipitation at the surface of the Earth. And in parallel with Kerry Emanuel, we were um, investigating the role that this uh, cloud processes, the interaction of clouds with radiation, but also the impact of rain evaporation, could have on the variability of the tropical atmosphere. And we found that the, the prominent scales of organization of the atmosphere along the equator at the intrasonal time scale were very, very sensitive to, the, to, to those processes, and including the phase speed of propagation of the, of the tropical waves. So at that point, we were increasingly uh, recognizing the importance of this interaction between clouds and circulation for many different aspects of climate. And um, we realized that many of the big puzzles of climate science were actually coming from the, our imperfect understanding of the interaction between clouds and, and circulation. It could be the, the problem of climate sensitivity, but also the problem of figuring out how the, the large-scale circulation would react to the increase of CO2. And so we, we, it became clear that we needed to bring together two different cultures that had been developing uh, a bit separately for many decades. The, from the scientific um, community, focusing on understanding the large-scale circulation of the atmosphere, and this other community uh, focusing on understanding clouds and their impact on the radiation budget. And we started to study the, those problems as part of a European project named Euclips that Pierre uh, coordinated for a few years. And then on a much larger scale, as part of the World Climate Research Programme, as part of a grand challenge of cloud circulation and climate sensitivity that Bjorn and I had the pleasure to, to propose and to coordinate for a decade. And as you can see on this picture from the first workshop of this grand challenge, at this workshop we had people who were really specialists in understanding clouds and cloud feedbacks, like Mark Webb, Pierre, and so on. But we also had people like Ted Shepard or Brian Hoskins, who were really specialists of, uh, of the last scale dynamics. And among the different puzzles that we wanted to address as part of this grand challenge was, of course, this uh, question of climate sensitivity and the role of clouds in it. And as, and as uh, Bjorn reminded us uh, earlier, we had shown that most of the uncertainty in cloud feedbacks in climate models was coming from some very specific regimes uh, of the tropics that were associated with a gentle subsidence and that were associated with uh, low-level clouds. And so we wanted to, to better understand what was controlling um, the cloudiness in those regimes, in the trade wind regimes, and figure out whether the, the most plausible models uh, were the, the models of predicting a, a high climate sensitivity because of a strong reduction of cloudiness with warming, or the models predicting a, a lower sensitivity because there was a less, uh, a much uh, smaller re uh, reduction of cloudiness with warming. And so with a team of young scientists, we analyzed what was controlling clouds in those regimes. 
And there are basically two ways of understanding the response of, of clouds to changes in environmental conditions. One is thermodynamic or uh, control of clouds. Obviously, clouds depend on humidity. And uh, we, clouds, are, as, as, clou uh, as, a, as Bjorn discussed earlier, also depend very much on the presence of vertical motions in the atmosphere at different scales, from the convective scales to, to, the, to the, the mesoscale. And um, by analyzing the, the, run, the, the response of clouds to warming in a range of models, what we showed is that the models that were predicting the strongest reduction of cloudiness with warming were the models that were represent, representing the cloudiness as being mostly thermodynamically controlled. While the models that were predicting a, a smaller response were the models that represented uh, a bit more strongly this coupling between clouds and, and vertical motions, and primarily the, the strength of the, uh, of the convection. And then with the, the Eureka campaign that we, we organized, um, we could well, Eureka was really designed to, to better understand what was controlling uh, the, the cloudiness in those regimes. And we could show, based on the observations, that clouds were really primarily controlled by the, the, the strength of the vertical motions by convection, and therefore giving much more uh, credibility to the models that were predicting a, a, a weaker change of cloudiness with warming, which in a way is, a, is, is is a good news for climate sensitivity. But when preparing Eureka, and, uh, and after that, we realized that there was a big, big elephant in the room, which was that when we look at pictures of clouds from space, we see that, those, that clouds, most of the time, um, exhibit patterns of organization at the mesoscale that can be very diverse. And, uh, and the models never really represented that, at least the climate models. So we needed to understand that. And these patterns of organization at the mesoscale are not specific to regimes of uh, shallow convection, but also occur in regimes of deep convection, as illustrated by this uh, photograph from the space station. And deep clouds really have this wonderful ability sometimes to aggregate and to form clusters. And surprisingly, for, for a long time, um, this behavior of convective clouds did not really raise a lot of interest in our community, except maybe for people who were studying uh, severe weather. But otherwise, it was not considered as being a remarkable issue, or I don't know, until Dutch scientists discovered that this behavior actually was taking place in their simulation, quite unexpectedly, actually. And this paper that was sent to me a month ago by uh, Hans Hermans actually <coughs> finds out that after just a few hours of simulation, the, the clouds spontaneously cluster. And he found this interesting, and he proposed, proposed that um, this behavior comes from the interaction between the moisture field and dynamics. And I'm sure that Martin, who's here, Martin Jensen, wouldn't disagree with this, uh, this conclusion. Martin uh, defended his uh, brilliant PhD last month at Verheningen University and the mesoscale organization of trade wind clouds. So during the last decade, there were many, many studies looking at this behavior of cloud clustering using mostly idealized modeling setups. So there, there were simulations of the radiative convective equilibrium for people who, who see what it is. And from, this, from the studies, we learned th three main things. The first one is that this clustering of convective clouds can occur spontaneously without any external driver, without rotation, just from the interaction of clouds with our environment. The second lesson is that this, the triggering of this behavior starts when, uh, together with the development of a mesoscale circulation in the, in the lower troposphere that connects the dry regions to the moist regions. And what has been shown is that um, the, the state of the clear sky atmosphere 
can be very influential in, in developing the circulations. Which means, for, for instance, when the clear sky atmosphere is very dry, that can generate some subsidence that triggers the mesoscale circulation that then transports energy from the dry to the moist region and then that can amplify the clustering. So that shows that to understand the behavior of clouds, sometimes you have to look at what's in, in the non-cloudy regions. And the third main lesson was that everything else being, being equal, when clouds are more clustered, then on average over the large scale, over the large domain, the, the whole domain of the simulation, the, atmos the atmosphere is much drier. And there are less upper level clouds as well, and therefore the relative fluxes at the top of the atmosphere are very different. We emit much more long wave radiation to space. So that means that the mesoscale organization of clouds can have an impact on the large scale, which means that it could have an impact on climate, on the humidity, but also on other aspects such as the intensity of precipitation extremes. But of course, those, uh, those results were derived from very idealized modeling uh, studies. So we needed to, to check whether there was some resonance or at least some support with, uh, from observations. And actually, there is. Um, we analyzed many years of satellite observations, and we diagnosed the, the degree of aggregation of convection at the mesoscale. And what we found is that the more clustered the convection at the mesoscale, the drier the atmosphere on average over the whole tropics, and also the stronger the radiative cooling of the planet. And we could show that it was not a small, a small impact, and it's really a first-order impact. So uh, that suggests that indeed the mesoscale organization of convection can have a climate impact, and that raises the question of whether that could be associated with climate feedbacks in a warming climate if the aggregation of convection changes with warming. So the big question that uh, we would like to address now is how will the cloud organization change in the future? And I think, yeah, that's really a fundamental question for, for us. That will be important for climate, because that could be associated with climate feedbacks. But it's also important for weather, I guess, because it means that if aggregation tends to be easier in a warmer climate, for instance, that means that we might have a, a more frequent occurrence of mesoscale convective systems that are associated with uh, strong precipitation and so on. So that's a question that is of interest for climate, but also for weather. And, and understanding how weather phenomena might change in the future. And if this change in organization also affects the large scale circulation of the atmosphere, then it means that it could also be important for climate at the regional scale, which uh, at first order depends on, on the large scale circulation. And to address this question, uh, we need to much better understand the, the interaction between the mesoscale and the planetary scale. And that's obviously a, a, a challenging question, but fortunately we are witnessing many great advances in our field that uh, are really opening up great opportunities to tackle this question. One of those advances is the emergence of a completely new generation of climate models, which for the first time can simulate the atmosphere at the kilometre scale, but globally. And you know, in, in climate science, we've always been using a, a higher hierarchy of uh, models to, to study climates, single column models, 2D models, uh, AMIX, simple models, general circulation models. But really, uh, developing these new models, uh, re resolving for the, first ca ta for the first time the mesoscale, is really like adding a new dimension to our climate models. So for the first time, we'll be able to, to study the, the role of the mesoscale processes in controlling the large-scale circulation of the atmosphere, in controlling the Earth's radiation budget and the feedbacks that might be associated with it. So it's a great opportunity to learn new things about uh, how the climate system works. It will be also an opportunity to narrow the gap between observations and simulations because for the first time, those models will be able to, to simulate scales that we can observe every day, every five minutes, uh, every 10 minutes, with uh, geostationary satellites. 
So that means that it will be easier to evaluate the simulations, but it also probably accelerate model development because the connection between simulation and observation which, which will be much easier. And finally, it will help us address the question of how the weather phenomena will evolve in a changing climate, which um, will make climate change much more tangible and much more concrete. <clears throat> but obviously, that raises the question of the credibility of the projections that will be made with these models. Obviously, it's easy to e evaluate the realism of a simulation in the present-day climate, because we have observations but we don't have observations of the future. And therefore, if we want to assess the credibility of the projections, we will have to use exactly the same process as we have de been uh, developing over the years for the previous generation of models. It will, be, it will have to be based on our physical understanding of the responses which are produced by those models and on our ability to constrain those responses or to assess those, res those physical mechanisms using observations. Yeah, so the fact that we have to primarily assess the, the credibility of the projection based on physical processes means that we have to better understand the physical processes that control climate, and in particular, this organization of convection. And as I said, based on all the modeling and theoretical studies that took place over the last years, we now have a better and better idea of what are the processes which seem to be important for mesoscale organization. But very few of those ideas have been tested with observations so far. So that's really an area where we have to make progress over the next years. And with that regard, we have many opportunities as well. Uh, for instance, from satellite observations, we have many, many more opportunities to observe the mesoscale from space. For instance, uh, I, ju I just showed uh, two examples here, but from satellite now, we are able to visualize the mesoscale structures you know, close to the surface, like those cold pools, for instance, that you see from SAR observations. And very soon, we'll have the Earthscare satellite, which for the first time will measure vertical velocities within clouds. And that will be something very important to understand the, the dynamics of clouds and their organization. And the space, space agencies have many more uh, projects uh, that they are cooking up. And we can also um, interpret the available observations in a new way. And I'm showing you here an example from the PhD work of my student, Basile Pujol, at LMD, who showed that by looking at the time variation of the brightness temperature measured from geostationary satellites in the water vapor channel, we are actually able to measure the vertical velocity in the mid-troposphere in clear sky conditions. And as you can see on this figure, uh, that reveals many, many new things, new features, and uh, for, because we have this information at a resolution of two kilometers. And so you see, for instance, uh, and in the top, you, that we, we can visualize gravity waves. We can also visualize the impact of, of tropical waves generating some ascending motion in the mid-troposphere, even in clear sky. We can see the, the subsidence around the deep organized systems, which, can, which is very strong. So this type of new observation that we infer from old observations will be very useful to understand the, the organization of convection. And, uh, and as we, we discussed earlier, the clear sky can be very important in controlling the behavior of clouds. And finally, in next term, we have the project of organizing a field campaign over the tropical Atlantic Ocean, targeting specifically uh, um, the mesoscale organization of convection. And we'll have several research aircraft and, and a ship to, to really decipher the mechanisms which we think are, are important in controlling the organization. So just to summarize, uh, I think that one of the big questions for the next decade will really be to understand this interaction between the kilometer scale or the mesoscale and, and the planetary scale. And um, we, it will be important for climate change, for different aspects of climate, as, we, as we've, we've seen. It will be also important for understanding how weather phenomena might evolve in, in the future. And uh, for this purpose, we will need observations, of course. We will need big models, like those global kilometer scale models. 
but we will also need toy models because really, the, ultimately, the, the only way we can assess the credibility of what the models produce is really by understanding what's going on and understanding how the atmosphere and the climate works. So the toy models are super important. So I will thank you again, everyone, for being here. Thanks again to the Academy for awarding me this wonderful prize. And thank you to all my colleagues for yeah, making the research on clouds so fun. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Sandrine, for this very wonderful and intriguing view uh, in the past, but also uh, in the future. And it seems like there is uh, still an exciting, uh, exciting role for, uh, for research to explore, especially the role of cloud organization on, on weather and on climate, uh, especially in this era of, of climate change. Uh, um, and also how it affects, by the way, things like precipitation. Uh, um, so for the last part, I'm looking a little bit at the watch. Uh, uh, we thought uh, we could have some in questions about uh, this whole presentation, but we thought it would be nice to broaden up the discussion a, a little bit by uh, uh, having a short uh, uh, discussion about the more broader question about the role of fundamental science in this era of global warming. I mean, uh, uh, I think everybody feels this, uh, this tension between climate science and, and climate action, on the other hand. Um, you hear the opinion that uh, we know enough about climate change, uh, may maybe we should put our efforts much more into climate action, mitigation, adaptation. On the other hand, you see, I mean, here very clearly um, <clears throat> that we don't really know in, uh, enough about climate change, right? So really fundamental change, uh, fundamental research about climate uh, is still uh, uh, absolutely necessary. And then your work really showed that uh, in, in, a fantastic, uh, in a fantastic way. So the question is really how to divide our efforts uh, uh, and how to uh, divide our, our resources, right, uh, to do research, uh, where to focus on. Uh, and for that, uh, I actually, I asked all three, Bjorn, Sandrine, and Martin, to come up with a proposition in the Dutch tradition of PhDs, uh, uh, to come up with a proposition along this, this theme. And uh, I would like to invite both Bjorn and, and, and Martin to come uh, to the stage. And, also you, Sandrine, uh, to have a seat and um, to go to this last part where we discuss a one or two <laughs> propositions and also uh, to give you, the audience, an opportunity to, uh, uh, to ask questions or your ideas about that. And uh, um, <coughs> I have uh, taken one of your propositions. I mean, there are many. I think we could sit here for a long time, but we won't. Uh, uh, um, and we go to the first proposition, let's see, uh, this is the one from Bjorn. The IPCC and the assessment culture with which it is associated, associated is impeding scientific progress. So I would like briefly, Bjorn, to shortly explain uh, uh, the deeper meaning of your, your, uh, your, uh, your proposition. And then Martin and Bjorn you can, and Sandrine, you can respond to it. And then, of course, also for you, the audience, uh, uh, if you have an, 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 an idea about this, please uh, uh, give your opinion. So, Bjorn. So I'll try to be short, and then we can develop this more in conversation, if you like. Um, I like, in the Dutch tradition, to um, propose something which I'm not sure I believe myself, but it's a good way to... <laughs> to exercise my thoughts on that, and it's something that I um, have a certain amount of affinity with that statement, um, that the IPCC assessment process, which was started in 1989 um, in May with a memo, um, is, is really, it does two things. It, um, it involves the scientific community in what's become an enormous routine um, of report writing big reports, 47 reports, 30,000 pages, 100 kilograms, um, which, which effectively distances us from society. And by focusing the report writing on an assessment of what we know, we're distracted from the driving force of science, 
which is what we don't know. So as our community gets so involved with always reminding everyone of what we know, we cut ourselves off from the scientific talent of people who want to explain the unknown. And so I think the IPCC process right now is, um, is, is diminishing our ability to talk about what we don't know, and talking about what we don't know is what actually gives birth to new science. Who wants to respond? Okay. Um, should you I take your, the mic you have still your... Uh, still working, okay. <laughs> Um, well, I have maybe a more nuanced view on this. Um, I think it, it would still be useful to make assessments on different, well, on the state of knowledge of our science. But I think that maybe the IPCC should not be the only one uh, to, to do this type of thing. And I, I think it would be much more um, useful if the scientific community itself was taking charge of, of, of making the assessment of what we do know and what we don't know, especially because if this assessment is done as part of the World Climate Research Program, for instance, we can both explain what we do know, but what we don't know, and how, what would be the research avenues to, to, to address uh, those gaps in knowledge, while the IPCC obviously cannot do that. And then the IPCC could just summarize those assessments, and in, and discuss the political implications of, of, of this. So uh, maybe we, we should envision a, a different um, a different complementarity between uh, the IPCC and the scientific community. So I'll probably disagree with this statement, um, and, and to the extent that it would be true, I think it's the scientific community that is doing it to itself, because we, we, are, we didn't set up the IPCC for the sake of scientific progress. We set up the IPCC as a science policy interface, and for that, I think it is still playing a critical role. Um, but we have become very distracted uh, and, and, and somewhat internally oriented, I think, in, in that, I think, still a labor of love for everyone involved uh, with many you know, blood, sweat, and tears of volunteer time going into it. Um, but, but, but a bit off track. I mean, I'm, just an anecdote, I was a coordinating lead author in working group two, actually, so more on, on the field of impacts and adaptation. And at the end of the whole cycle, after we've, we've been through the, the, the nights, also with the governments actually during COVID, doing this all online, so we hadn't even seen each other as a community, which I think is often, by the way, where I'd see a lot of the scientific spin-offs, spending time with colleagues, also interdisciplinarily. Uh, but anyhow, we didn't even get that this time. Uh, but then at the very end, they offered me to send me the printed version. Of course, most of this is done in, in, uh, in PDFs nowadays, but I thought, oh, it's nice, you know, just to, to see the thing at the end. Yeah. Um, so they, they asked, do, do you want a copy? So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll have a copy. So they offered to send me a copy, so I asked for the address, and then they sent me a copy, but I got a whole box. <laughs> I was like, I, I asked for one copy. I didn't ask for a whole stack of copies. Well, it turned out the whole box was one copy. <laughs> Uh, and I think that says something about how this has gone a bit off track. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what does the science policy interface need? And I think one thing it needs, and, and possibly more so even in working group two than in working group one, but I think it could inspire working group one, is much more of a risk management attitude, which actually asks the IPCC towards policymakers to be much more explicit about uncertainties and to talk about what we know and what we don't know in science by way of talking about risks. Uh, and I think that might then actually also get, get us a bit further from that risk of, of impeding scientific progress if that also maps what we need to work on on the side of fundamental science to reduce those uncertainties. Do you want Quick to respond? response? Or? <laughs> and then uh, uh, well, before we, we go to the, to we, the we audience. Can, I, yeah. I, I think those are all good yeah. comments. I yeah? think okay. it'd be fun to involve other <clears> people. Um. Any, anybody from the audience? I see. People have been active in IPCC, so I'm sure there are um, ideas, responses. Yeah, Gerard. What about yes. The role of WCRP? I wonder what, what you are asking for is what actually WCRP is supposed to be doing to lay out programs, science plans, and, and, and specify the uncertainties. So actually, it exists, yeah. in my opinion. Absolutely. Yeah. So w what's wrong with the structure? WCRP is doing the research, right? But what I was 
just suggesting is that WCRP should play a much uh, a bigger role in assessing uh, different areas of the science. In, uh, like we, we have uh, done, for instance, for the climate sensitivity, the WCRP has organized a community assessment on climate sensitivity. It took several years to, to, to develop this, but at the end, it, it's been super useful. And, 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 and for this assessment, they could really uh, ask all the specialists of the field to, to contribute. And then the IPCC built on, on this assessment very much to, to make their assessment of climate sensitivity. But what was done for the climate sensitivity should be done for many other aspects of climate and climate change. And so I think that, that yeah, WCRP should integrate this mission a little bit more and avoid that the IPCC authors have to synthesize a pile of articles like that. They should just summarize uh, or, or take the key messages from the, these assessments. Okay, thanks. Other response? Yeah, Vicha? <coughs> yeah, so <coughs> wait, wait. Uh, former, sorry, former climatologist. I ordered the IPCC uh, report. So it's, as you said, it's 20 kilos. It's a huge pile of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, reports. But, but I think even more importantly, um, I think they are, have become unreadable because of all the cross, uh, uh, cross, uh, how do you call it? Uh, 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 Verwijzingen. Uh, uh, references. References. And so the, 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 the question uh, that raises for me is whether uh, the IPCC, uh, 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 report-wise, is still a, uh, a science policy interface. I mean, I, th I can imagine that the, 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 the whole, um, the, 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 the scientists and the, and, the, and the way they interact with, with politicians on a higher scale uh, is, is, is still working. But I mean, the report itself I don't see they have a, a lot of a, much function because, as I said, for me they are unreadable. Well, I think they're they're great for PhD students, but they're a very uh, <laughs> labor-intensive way to 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 produce that oversight for 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 the the PhDs. Um, what I think in the end is the important policy science policy interface is the summary for policymakers mostly, but science, the summary for policymakers needs to have a line of sight to an executive summary of a chapter that needs to have a line of sight to a section in a chapter which needs to have a line of sight to a set of scientific papers that, that prove that point. And um, I, I, I do see that mechanism working. So I, I do see also that traceability being part of the discussions with governments during the approval plenaries and, um, and, and having to defend what is in the end also really significant for where the world is now putting, you know, make, making big choices on climate action, spending billions of dollars, making big difficult regulatory changes to then ask the question, can you really trace that back to the science, I think is a, a valuable process. Mm -hmm. I would argue that that whole process has now become so heavy that doing it every seven or eight years comprehensively for all the science is becoming too heavy. So I think what, what you're proposing, putting more of the scientific leadership in WCRP and then asking ourselves the question, okay, when does something that the scientific community is addressing result in such an update that we need to reassess what the science policy interface for that then means. And at that point then providing a smaller, nimbler, also shorter because it doesn't have to cover all the references on everything report uh, would be a more efficient way. Now I don't think we can do that for the IPCC because it's very difficult to reform an inter inter intergovernmental organization. Uh, but we are asking ourselves that question for instance in KNMI for the next iterations of the climate scenarios that we've just produced in the Netherlands based on the last IPCC cycle. I don't think we'll just be doing the next round of scenarios whenever the IPCC has produced its next round, I think we'll go nimbler and, and shorter and lighter. So maybe I just would quick jump in because part of my complaint is it's heavy, it's slow, and it, it is filling in for something more fundamental which is missing. So we like to think that, that climate change is an important problem. But there's not a single institution that I know of in the world whose first priority is climate change. So. We, we have lots of institutions whose second priority is climate change, but no institution whose first priority is climate change. And we miss this service level, you know, this idea of interacting with society, and we substitute with the service level by report writing. And so 
because we lack the service level, imagine if we did weather reports by, you know, weather forecasts by asking scientists to kind of write reports about what the weather would be like, then it would be really too slow. But, but it would, you know, we, we've learned in many scientific activities when we're successful in science, then we create service organizations which fill the information need. And we don't do that in climate science. What we all do is we, we distract the basic science community into report writing um, to interact with the policy community. And we, we, what we need is an is a organization which interacts with society for adaptation, for, for, for risk reduction, for, for policy information. And that, that's totally missed because we think somehow that this policy interface of your 20, 20 kilograms actually you know, is doing something. And then, and then we get bogged down by these sorts of things. So anyway. <laughs> One last reaction, I think, by uh, you. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> to your last yeah. comment, there's hope. There's also the KIN initiative, also from the KNW, building the bridge between the science and the practical on behavior change. Um, but another question, we have the KNMI. What will happen if you get the opportunity and we have the, the, the weather uh, forecast every evening on the television. If you get the opportunity to, to present this, but then in, in specific with the clouds, in combination with climate change, how it will look like? Yeah, so um, unfortunately or fortunately, but, but um, well, according to the separation of roles and responsibilities in Dutch society, uh, we, we don't present the, the weather on the news as KNMI. So that's, uh, that's uh, for the commercial ones, it's uh, the commercial weather companies for NOS, they've got their own folks doing that, uh, who are doing it very well, by the way, I think. But, but you should be having that discussion with them. I do think that this is, this is golden material. One thing we'll be doing is running future weather runs alongside the, the, the regular, regular weather forecast for, for tomorrow. And that, that material is available also to the TV weather presenters. And I hope they'll be picking it up. We'll be using it as well to generate material for them. Because I do think that is part of the, um, the, the, the sort of science society interface, at least with the general public. Uh, that we that could liven up some of these discussions. I think what they'll find is that you know there'll be many questions, uh, and and we should we should use it not to just give very sharp answers, but partly to spark their curiosity. And I, I hope you know they should have been in this in this audience. I hope they'll they'll also once in a while, um, in that one minute that they get, spend 30 seconds talking about the stuff that we don't understand and what that means for um, where we where we still need the science, but also where we need to manage uncertainty in our decision making, for instance, in adaptation in the Netherlands. OK. I would like to give, actually. I do think Wilco would be very interesting to hear on this <laughs> topic. <laughs> <laughs> the word to Wilco, uh, Wilco Haaslegger. Not sure. Wil yeah. Wilco Haaslegger, Utrecht yeah. University. Uh, I, yeah, I agree. T all those kilograms, 10 years of, of working, the community working so hard is probably not the best for, for science. The, the way Maarten just explained IPCC is a one-way street. And that's from science to policy, and not really that, that interactive part. So I wonder, and it's the same actually, probably true in my opinion for CMIP and WCRP. That's a lot of activity while one wonders, is this really worth the effort here? What about the other way around? Can, cannot IPCC as an assessment also not inspire science? And in a way, that climate sensitivity question that Sandrine brought up, that, that's how it goes the other way around. But currently, the way you, you describe it right now, it's from science, a lot of effort to how we inform policy. And I would say if you need to focus our fundamental research, turn that question around as well and, and increase that interactivity to really to make that work. And I guess that, that's the part that misses in the current IPCC process, because it's only basically a one-way street and having any credibility from science. I, I, I would largely agree. Um, I think so. So um, I think that there's a, a bit of a difference between working group one and working group two here. And my experience in IPCC is more in working group two. One of the challenges I see there is that the the global nature of IPCC also really um, doesn't fit the, the the type of policy questions that are being asked right now. I mean, the, the best we have are, are regional chapters. So they look at the whole of Europe, for instance, and the the implications that people want information about, but also the sort of policy environment that they want this interface to understand, okay, what do we need to study more in order to answer your questions better? 
that doesn't happen even at the level of a chapter, which is already too long and already too weighty a process to do. So I, I think we're already seeing a little bit, it's also in the Netherlands, for instance, with the, the National Scientific Advisory Board on Climate Change, uh, I'm, I'm on the European one, uh, you see those sorts of fora emerging where I think that interface is already sli slightly, um, slightly happening. Um, but I think much more of it is also happening in the interfaces in practice. And so what I see, for instance, from my new role in the Netherlands, um, I've been uh, talking to water boards, for instance, and, and their engineers are asking the right questions about climate change right now. And that is, that is now also triggering some of this fundamental science, for instance, on better understanding extreme rainfall and understanding droughts. And that is then also leading us to do more fundamental science to be able to answer the questions right. So it's at a much more granular service-oriented level, as you were saying rather than driven by these global assessments. Thank you. I'm looking at the words. I think that was uh, an, a, a nice conclusion, and I don't think we will solve this whole problem how to, the interaction with science and, <laughs> and uh, policy makers uh, will be, but we can continue the discussion uh, uh, with a drink and a snack, uh, which will be served uh, at the reception hall. So um, I would like to thank actually everybody for this fantastic uh, afternoon. The Royal Academy, hey, Marlene, uh, uh, for making this happen, happening. The KNMI, Martin, uh, uh, for it. Uh, the jury, of course. Uh, uh, um, Bjorn, Bjorn, Bjorn Stevens for, for providing the, the nice overview. Of course, above all, uh, Sandrine, thank you very much. And uh, congratulations once more. And you, the audience. So let's give uh, ourselves all an applause. <laughs> <laughs>